Tanakoto Kato, Kiora, good morning. Uh, my name is Michael McCauley. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. It's wonderful to be working again with my friends and colleagues at Anzog. Uh, I'm very grateful for, for the invitation to speak to everyone today. Thank you very much to our wonderful sound man at the back who promised no feedback, which is very kind of him. Uh, and thanks to Tracy, who helped organize uh, my trip over here. And thanks to the wonderful Rosie, who has helped corral us onto the stage today. Uh, it's a great privilege also to speak with such wonderful and august speakers uh, as Paul and Alan. I'm particularly glad you mentioned uh, the philosopher Bono, Paul, because what, what he doesn't know about corruption isn't worth knowing. And, and of course, it was that knowledge that helped inform his choice to move his tax affairs to a Dutch tax haven a, a few years ago. Uh, whereas Alan, unfortunately, now I, I can't help but see in my mind people's pleasure and playing centers just flashing on and off like some form of kind of 50 shades of public value. Uh, it's all, all a bit strange. Now, I'm here and I'm honored to be representing the great country of New Zealand. I work at Victoria University in Wellington. The sharp-eared among you might have already detected that I, I don't have a traditional Kiwi accent. Uh, and that's because I'm from a town called Middlesbrough in the northeast of England. Now, if you don't know Middlesbrough, it, it's, it's a paradise. Uh, <laughs> I swear to God, you think Queenstown's nice, it's got, got nothing on us. And in fact, it's so nice that I daren't put photographs up because I don't want to cause a mass wave of emigration. <laughs> However, for the people who do know Middlesbrough, don't tell them. Keep, keep it our little secret. Okay, keep the dream alive. Uh, one, funnily enough, just before I start, there is one little benefit of, of moving to Australasia. I've been in New Zealand for two and a half years. And one unintended consequence, which has been very beneficial to me, is that finally, despite my rather heavy northeast accent, people do seem to finally understand me. Uh, no one knows where the hell I'm from, uh, even when I tell them, but they do understand me, which, believe it or not, never used to happen in Britain. Uh, and if you don't believe me, have a little look around now, and I guarantee there'll be a few British expats nudging each other going, what's he on about? <laughs> I haven't got a clue. Uh, on a more serious note, it's a very apposite time to be talking about transparency, trust, and public value. I don't know if anyone saw the report yesterday. I read it with interest. That uh, in the last five years, there's been some political party donations here in Victoria to the tune of 54 million Australian dollars, uh, none of which are actually traceable, all of which are legal, all of which were made under the threshold of where you have to declare how much it is and where it's from, which added together totals across all political parties, I'm not singling anybody out, $54 million in five years. If ever there's anything that talks about a need for potential transparency, surely, my friends, I would suggest that's one of the cases. And it's something I'm going to return to later with research that I did in the UK on political party funding. Obviously, uh, Paul, you alluded to the helicopter trips uh, of Bronwyn Bishop. Uh, and I thought Tony Abbott responded to that in a very interesting way. Uh, I, I, uh, forgive me, I'm not probably quoting it exactly right, but he mentioned about when Bronwyn Bishop stepped down. He said, uh, unfortunately, some members of parliament still behave within entitlement, but outside of public expectations. Now, I, I don't know, I'm not sure if Tony Abbott's renowned for his words of wisdom, but it struck me that that was a very, very, very uh, significant uh, admission that sometimes our public figures do act within their entitlements, do act within, within everything that the rules say that they can do. And yet that's not enough, is it? And that's something I'm gonna to return to with the conclusion, but I'll flag it up now, because when we talk about trust or transparency or public value, we've all gotta be aware that the people trying to create that aren't necessarily the ones who are gonna judge whether or not it's succeeded. I can't make you trust me. That's gonna be, you know, your, your, your gift to give. I can try and make things as transparent as I want, but it might never be enough. And as for public value, we're all trying to create public value. You are all trying to create public value, no doubt doing a great job. But you're not the recipients. You're not the ones to judge whether or not that service has been valuable. So that's just something for us to bear in mind. But before I do, uh, Paul, I, I don't want to, obviously I'm going to accidentally touch upon some of the things that Alan and Paul both said, but hopefully not too much. You mentioned the, the very first thing about the, the kind of the equation trust and, uh, and transparency. Uh, and I think intuitively we all understand what the relationship is here, don't we? That increased transparency should hopefully lead to deeper levels of trust, which will hopefully lead to a, a bigger store of public value. 
but, but we all know that it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, and before I get on to kind of any heavy duty research, I'm just going to tell us a little story, uh, which is a trip down memory lane. Forgive me if some people know this story, but please do bear with me. It's a story about a wonderful young man called uh, Anthony Charles Lytton Blair. You can call him Tony. Uh, who was, of course, Prime Minister for 13 years in, in Britain uh, and did some remarkable things, did some things that people disagreed with, did some things that people thought were fantastic. We're not here, seriously, not here to judge him. But one thing to be aware of is, of course, he had a very privileged background, very privileged upbringing, uh, public school educated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but Tony always understood, and if you read his, bio, or his autobiography, you, you can read this for yourself, always understood the power of empathy. And so one of the things that he always tried to do was remind people that he was a human just like the rest of us. Uh, and one of the things he did was, of course, have an allegiance to Newcastle United Football Club. Uh, and one of his cherished childhood memories that he went on record as, as saying one of, the, one of the things he remembered most vividly from being a little kid was seeing that guy play. Now, if you don't know who that guy is, he's a, he's a fellow called Jackie Milburn. Uh, and until relatively recently, he was Newcastle's most famous ever player. Uh, played in the 40s and 50s. His highest goal scorer until comparatively recently. But, but an absolute icon in Newcastle. If, if you want to, you, you know, the classic embodiment of what a Geordie is, what a, a Newcastle person is, there he is, it's Jackie Milburn. And, and Tony remembered vividly standing in the Gallagate end in St. James Park, watching Jackie bag a few goals and cheering on. Uh, and then it emerged, of course, that uh, Tony Blair was far too young to ever see Jackie Milburn play. Uh, and and, and the, that, that memory it just didn't happen. It didn't happen. Now, again, we're not here to judge. It's just an interesting situation, is it not? That someone would purposefully or, or even subconsciously, without realizing it, conjure up these vivid pictures of their most chi cherished childhood memories that turn out to be entirely false. And people still talk about this to this day. Do, do you remember that story? Do, do, are, are people aware of that story? No. Oh, well, you won't know who this fellow is either. Uh, that's a guy called Keith Toppin, who was a local journalist in Newcastle, uh, who made the whole thing up. He made the whole thing up. Yeah, there you go. Someone, someone who's heard the story actually gasps. Thanks, Werner. Uh, Tony Blair never said it, never once, never claimed to have seen Jackie Milburn play. Uh, that's Keith Topping. He actually has gone on record time and time and time again saying, yeah, it was a prank. It kind of went a bit too far, but I've admitted it now. The point being, that is transparently a lie about Tony Blair. And yet I'll bet you a pound to a penny. You poll anybody in Britain and they'll still believe the lie. And Paul, you just mentioned at the end about the potentially inverse relationship about transparency, whether or not transparency matters. When it comes to something like this, it doesn't matter. Why? Because people trust the legend. Why? Because the legend is more authentic. Truth doesn't actually matter. So, some research. Paul's mentioned some of this as well, so I won't go on onto it too much. Mason et al., that's a, a recent study of the UK police force. Kim and Lee, that's a study of uh, politics in South Korea. And Grimla Kuisen, uh, that's a study of online behavior uh, and e-government and online activity. And these, these articles suggest that there is a positive link between transparency, increased transparency, and deeper levels of trust. But, but, only in the sense that it helped develop and enhance trust that was already there. So in the police case, for example, uh, where there was no transparency around the police force's activities, and then some transparency, trust didn't move. But where there was already some transparency, and then there became increased transparency, then trust seemed to improve a little bit. So it's enhancing what's gone before. It's not starting from a position of no trust to a position of some trust. It's in each of these cases, starting from a position of some trust to a position of slightly more trust. But more recent studies again suggest, uh, and again, I, I don't wish to repeat too much, that actually the evidence is inconclusive. Uh, Grimlick Reason et al., uh, that's a, another recent study. That's a comparative study between the Netherlands and South Korea. And those authors are, are quite explicit that there's actually no evidence whatsoever. It's, it's entirely inconclusive at this stage. But, to be fair, you're entirely correct. There hasn't been enough research yet, has there? There the, the, the really hasn't. Uh, Milena Nashkova has very recently, this is a conference paper, but she said I'm allowed to quote it, has done a study of local government in the Florida area in the US. 
and she found something that's really, really interesting. Uh, and that's that it wasn't necessarily trust she was looking at, she was looking at participation. Uh, and she actually found that in, in areas, in, in localities where there'd been political scandals, political participation increased. So whether or not trust increased, we, we're not really sure, but it certainly got people's interest increased and people's participation increased, and that spoke to me. Uh, and m to be fair, Milena, you know, she's got a lot more work to do on this, and, and she's made that clear, that I, I need to make that clear. But it spoke to me because I don't know how many people followed the New Zealand election uh, last year, but for the first time in quite, quite a while, the, uh, voting, uh, uh, the amount of people voting in that election actually went up from 74% in 2011 to 77% in 2014. Uh, and, and what was interesting to me, I don't know if you can see this, but the, the election was dominated by this book, this book called Dirty Politics, uh, which has been hugely debated. I'm, I'm not here to actually talk about the book itself. But it was all about the potential lack of transparency around governments, not a particular government, about dirty deals done dirt cheap, to quote a wonderful Australian lyricist, uh, and all sorts of misbehavior behind the scenes. Now, this is speculative, I don't know, no one's done any work on this, but I thought it was interesting that an election that had been so dominated by negativity and scandal actually saw people vote in bigger numbers than previously. Maybe there's something in it. The other question, and uh, Alan and Paul have both kind of touched on this as well, is what is trust anyway? I mean, we use trust in so many different ways, don't we? We use it to kind of, uh, Alan, I think you mentioned about the idea of it's almost like a proxy for satisfaction. When we say someone trusts the government, are we actually suggesting that they like the government rather than they trust the government? Uh, individually, we use it to kind of measure our own expectations. We trust you to do something in the future. We'll trust you to do that. It's a measure of expectation. We use it also as, as a measure kind of, uh, of abuse, don't we? Ah, trust him. You know. It means all sorts of different things. But there are, there are at least two elements to trust that have kind of been touched upon. I don't think they've been touched upon explicitly, though. And they're the elements of intimacy and authenticity. Alan's entirely right. These, these trust is an emotional state. It, it goes directly to the brain. And it requires intimacy, and it requires authenticity. And we can see how this works in, in political. Uh, just a, a selection of MPs there. I'm not talking about them specifically. But you'll, you'll know better than me the trust uh, across all governments is plummeting, apart from New Zealand, actually. If you look at the OECD trust surveys that are done, New Zealand is one of the very few countries who, in the, in the latest uh, trust survey, which is a few years old now, trust has actually increased in the government. Everywhere else, it's plummeting. Uh, the survey that I was looking at with great interest is the Scanlon Social Cohesion Survey. Uh, I don't know how many people are aware of that. It's a great tool. It, it, it's, it's out every single year. And there's a question. There's a question asked in that about trust and government. And the question is, to what extent do you trust the government in Canberra to do the right thing for Australian people? Gary, uh, you mentioned earlier that trust in Australia is at an all-time low. According to Scanlon, it's at the second all-time low. Uh, <laughs> because last year, it was 27.7%. This year, it's, it's marginally gone up to 30%. Why is this interesting? Well, because... It reflects the trust surveys that are done in every single country that I've ever been aware of. But what the Scanlon survey doesn't ask that other surveys do is not how much you trust politicians, how much you trust the government, how much you trust your member of parliament. Because when we ask this question in the trust surveys that are run by Mori uh, in the UK, they always ask those two questions. And every single time, trust in the government, trust in politicians as a group is low, trust in your local MP, much higher. They do the same for local go government. Trust in councils, very low indeed. Trust in your councillor, considerably higher. Why? May I suggest intimacy. We feel that we know these people a lot more. The problem is, intimacy is really easy to manufacture. Some, some of us will know this through bitter personal experiences that I won't even dwell on. But we'll have been taken in by people that we trusted intimately and were let down badly. It's, it's not difficult to manipulate. Neither is authenticity. In fact, we manipulate our own ideas of authenticity. I'll give you just a few examples of how we manipulate, not necessarily in a, in a, in a Machiavellian sense, not necessarily in a bad sense, 
but just in, in a way that we kind of fool ourselves into believing we've had authentic experiences. Look, look at this. That's a piece of the true cross, a holy relic. And, and, and I'm sure that's the real one, whereas the other thousands in the world are all, are all the fake ones. I'm sure that one's real. But once upon a time, there was this idea that we have something, something that's been touched by a magic power. And that is an authentic thing, and we can keep that, and we can worship that actual physical object. And then we move on, we look at the idea of autographs. That's authentic because we might have met those people who've signed that shirt, and if we haven't, we still know that someone signed that shirt. We've got a piece of that. It's like an interaction. It's an authentic experience. What's the 21st century equivalent? Selfies. Even politicians take selfies. Hilariously, I've had to crop the photo so you can't see Ed Miliband desperately trying to get in. Uh, shoo, shoo, Ed, get off. You're never going to win the next election. That was the day I went to the bookmakers, ladies and gentlemen. 18 months before the election. Uh, and, and just to return to the point, the, the idea is that authenticity is it's always constructed. And if you read people like Drew Weston and other political marketers and other political psychologists, you will see how authenticity is, is, is attempted to be constructed, how politicians portray themselves as something other than they are in order to try and build uh, a sense of trust and an and emotional relationship with people. Which is, again, to me, uh, no question why the Tony Blair myth is still believed. Because of all the other things that Tony Blair did, that's the common view of him in Britain to this day. Someone not to be really trusted. There's another question, and that is, uh, what are actually are the limits of transparency? I won't, I won't touch upon uh, Bronwyn's situation, although, again, very interesting words from, from Tony Abbott the other day. And notice that he doesn't use the trust word, he uses the word respect. And I think that's a really, actually, again, a very subtle, clever move. I don't know if he did it on purpose, but assuming that he did, that's a, that's a really clever, subtle move to move the debate away from the idea of trust back to respect. Because trust's gone, hasn't it? Trust has gone. And Paul has rightly said that it's gone largely because transparency forced it out. The gentleman on the right of the screen is a fellow called Peter Crudus, who you may or may not have heard of. Back in 2012, Peter Crudus was the deputy chair of the Conservative Party, uh, a treasurer, sorry, deputy treasurer of the Conservative Party, and he was caught on camera on a bit of a sting operation talking about how much money you need to pay to meet David Cameron. And he said, 100,000? That's not Premier League. Quarter of a million. That's Premier League. That'll get you a meeting with Dave. Now, believe it or not, uh, I had to go on the BBC about this. They thought I was auditioning for Crime Watch, but they did let me on the news. Uh, and they said to me, well, what, what, did you th what do you think of these comments? And my honest uh, response was, well, he's asking way too much. Be because it, <laughs> cause if you follow that link, ladies and gentlemen, you will get to all the different donor clubs that the Conservative Party offer. And it actually only costs you 50 grand to become a member of the Leaders Club. And the Leaders Club is the club where you, for 50 grand a year, get to meet David Cameron at private functions, meals, uh, occasionally after Prime Minister's question times, so on and so forth. And it is all transparent, up to a point. Because the difference is that that transparency is about access. That transparency is not about potential influence. And when we talk about transparency, I've already mentioned, it's not us, the people who are trying to create it, that will judge it. It has to be meaningful transparency. Uh, we, we interviewed a, a guy, I can't unfortunately name who it was, but you'll know him, uh, back in 2011 for the, for the project that I was working on in the UK at the time. And he mentioned about transparency because, to be fair to the coalition government as it, as it then was, th there's been a lot of work done in transparency, but it's all about surface level kind of stuff. Who's met who, not what did they talk about. Not how did it actually lead to a potential policy being made. Uh, and he said a fantastic quote I've never forgotten. It was, we used to say that sunlight was the best disinfectant, but now we see that it just creates more shadows in which we can hide. It has to be meaningful. There's a distinction between surface transparency and proper transparency. Uh, the political party situation is one I would suggest. It is, is one of those levels of there's access and there's influence, and then there's why don't we just actually just say, just declare everything. It might lead to slightly more paperwork, but it's not a big onerous task, is it? Uh, but there's an even more, <coughs> I hope I'm not going to step on any toes here, there's an even more, any more toes than I've already probably stood on, 
There's an even more searing question to ask here. How many of us are really actually committed to transparency? And I'm not thinking about NSA revelations. I'm not thinking about Five Eyes networks. I'm not thinking about anything to do with national security, anything like that. I'm thinking of, of one word, my friends, one word, this word. Now, I'm, I'm not criticizing anything to do with the behavioral, uh, uh, behavioral economics unit in, in Britain, despite the fact it, it's not susceptible to the Freedom of Information Act for some reason. Uh, but I'm not talking about that. I'm simply talking about the fact that if we're going to take a behavioral economics approach, a nudge approach, we have to do so under the curtain of opacity. We can't be transparent about it. We have to do it slightly hidden because otherwise the interventions that we're trying to nudge people towards, they won't work. They won't be as effective. The whole approach is one that by definition has to remove transparency. So before we all just assume transparency hey, is one of these great words, we have to really be honest with ourselves. Actually, are we always saying that it's great? Now all this might sound a little bit negative, I'm gonna leave you very quickly with, with two uh, from the very opposite ends of the spectrum pieces of work that I've been involved in because I've only got a few minutes left. The first uh, was, was only published last year but it was a, a project that my friend Alan Lott and I did a few years ago and it was about increasing trust in local government and we did a number of case studies uh, all of which you can see up there all very transparent uh, and what it was was essentially that there was a, a local standards committee that had been created with not just councillors on but actually people from from the local area non-elected co-opted members and what was interesting was over the years, they'd been allowed to evolve and develop their own integrity regimes. Uh, and if you want to look at the work, you'll see that far from just being uh, a, a, a committee that investigated councillors' misbehaviour or occasionally held hearings following investigations of council misbehaviour, they did all sorts of things. Community involvement, going into schools, civics education, uh, digital online media, outlets that, that weren't available on the council were done so uh, in the case of London through the standards committee all sorts of different things uh, and what's what was really good is that it wasn't just us who found this there was another study completely independent of ours uh, a statistical study done by Cardiff University around about the same time that also showed that certainly in England and Wales England and Wales wasn't Scotland England and Wales uh, the higher the levels of transparency around the integrity framework, the greater the levels of trust in that local authority. And the one I will leave you with is the Open Government Partnership. I was thrilled that Minister Bennett was speaking this morning because she's responsible uh, for the Open Government Partnership. Uh, and New Zealand joined last year, and there's a, there's a, there's a long way to go for New Zealand's journey. I'm, I've just been appointed onto the OGP advisory group over in New Zealand, along with a few other people. But what's interesting is that the, the four principles of the OGP, and the 65 countries have joined the OGP since 2012, the four principles are accountability, transparency, innovation, particularly through social digital media, uh, and public participation. And where the OG, and it's easy to be cynical about these things, it is, but where the OGP has really taken off are in places like the Philippines, places like Cambodia, places like Indonesia, where they've had all sorts of reforms. Why? because they've been led by civil society. It's called the Open Government Partnership, but it, it's really a civil society public participation framework. And where there's been an infrastructure developed for participation, and where people have been allowed to participate, we've found that people have done so in abundance, and also be, because they've actually been directly involved in both the creation and implementation of the various policies uh, and various initiatives, there's been a huge degree, uh, an uprise of trust. I was, I was so privileged, uh, I was in Bali last year for a, for a summit uh, on this, the Asia Pacific Regional Summit, and I had to speak uh, after a couple of guys on from Indonesia, uh, one of whom was an HIV sufferer, the other, the other was the uh, leader of the General Medical Council, and between those two uh, and their organisations and the Ministry for Health, there was a whole new HIV AIDS foundation set up in Indonesia, and it was very, very humbling, very humbling indeed to, to hear that. But that's all because of open government partnership. So there are ways and there are means, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and I will leave it there on what is hopefully a positive note. Uh, thank you very much.